Welcome to the Our Nature, Rethinking, Restoring, and Rebuilding Our Relationship with Nature, brought to you by the Community Life Collaborative in partnership with the Living Water Association. This presentation by Douglas Ptolemy was recorded on May the 6th at the Family Life Center in Bainbridge, Ohio. In order to reconstruct uh, a, an ecosystem, um, you have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. And there's two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. Those plants are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food, and storing that energy in their, their tissues. That is the food that drives all of the, the life on terrestrial earth. So now we have we have all the food that everything else needs in plant parts, but if we don't get into animals, you don't have any animals. Which means if you have a plant that is untouched, it is not helping the local food bank. It is not doing its job. Well, it turns out that most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that eat plants. And most of those invertebrates are insects, and not just any insects. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eat. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's a chickadee that uh, is, is at my house in southeast Pennsylvania. If you've got the black cat chickadee here, practically the same bird doing the same thing. They are the birds, one of the birds at our feet is all one along eating seeds. So we tend to think that's what chickadees need. Well, 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds, but the other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. But when they reproduce, which they're just starting to do now, uh, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they switch to insects entirely, and if they're in a healthy environment, they will really become exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America rear their young on insects, not seeds. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a citizen science project that one of my students did a few years, a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers. Uh, asking them to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they are carrying food to the nest. They're going to send those pictures to Ashley. She's going to identify the prey items that are in the bees and reconstruct the nesting diet for as many species of birds uh, as she could in North America. And she got thousands of pictures, so she was able to do it for a lot of birds. And what you're looking at is the a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diets of the 20 most common bird families in North America that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of those 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we created landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them. Most of the birds are unable to breed. And you're only unable to breed for a little while before you disappear because there's no baby birds. <clears throat> so, Something is special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars, and one of them is that they are soft. Think of this guy, he's a little sausage. The very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is it's, it's exoskeleton, it's chitin, it's un, undigestible, so the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring with that fear of it. And if you've ever watched the parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger, you just stuff it down. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 acres. And some of our smaller birds chase acres or rabbits. They want to chase 200 acres or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious. They're high in fat, high in protein, and a low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of the beetle is undigestible. Uh, and a lot of people have very sharp edges too. Finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. You're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. 
where the birds getting their crop nuts from? From what they're eating, of course, but uh, crop nut content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. Those two tall bars on the on the end here are types of caterpillars. They have far more crop nuts than other types of bird prey. A little butterfly in the middle there. That's the adult caterpillars, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer crop nuts because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillar eating the green leaves where the crop nuts are. And way down at the other end there, that's the earthworm. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any crop nuts. So, yes. so that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird nuts. They're essential parts of bird nuts. So let's just say birds eat caterpillars. Okay, the next question is, how many caterpillars do they eat? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Let's go back to chickadees. There are a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees just to get into the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a tiny bird, bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want to be as you breed in your yard, and I would think you do, you've got to have all those caterpillars in your yard because the chickpea only forages about 50 meters from the nest. It's not flying five miles down the road to the nearest wood lot. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that they get from it. People are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. as a Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we've divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that require insects in some part of their life history, that's the bar on the my left. And the species that don't require insects. So things like doves and finches uh, can actually make a little milk out of, out of seeds so they feed that to the young. Well, the birds that don't require insects didn't decline at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects decline on average 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take away bird food, they'll lose the birds. So we need a new goal when we're landscaping. In the past, we've had one goal, and that is to make pretty landscapes. Okay, we can still make pretty landscapes, but now we have to make ecologically functional pretty landscapes. Uh, and yes, that will be a little bit harder, but we can do it. In other words, we've got to add insects to our landscapes, especially caterpillars. How do we add caterpillars to landscapes? You add the plants that support caterpillars. Seems pretty straightforward. But there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to be fussy about which plants we choose, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. You can have all the calorie pear and all of the boxwood and all of the ginkgos and all of the hostas and all the burning bush and all the barberry and all of the things we typically landscape with in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing is to create new monarch butterfly is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists just like the monarch. Why? Because plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects in the world from eating most of the plants in the world. And if you don't want to eat, take one of the plants on your center to see if you like. <laughs> You're not gonna like it. I don't think any are particularly tough. It's a really effective defense that keeps everything from, from eating those plants. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get the how do they get past those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. 
And an insect cannot adapt to all of them. So it picks one or two plant lineages that are really similar uh, and develops counter adaptations to those particular defenses. They develop the, the enzymes that store and excrete to detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. It takes a long time for all those adaptations to fall into place. But once they do, the insects locked into eating that particular group of plants because they didn't specialize on anything else. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and you put hospice in instead, the monarch's not going to start to develop on hospice. It has two choices. It's going to fly away and find milkweeds someplace else, or it's going to start with it. That's why when we bring in plants from someplace else, typically another continent around here, it's typically Asia. Uh, we're wrecking our food goods. Our native insects have not adapted to those plants. And if those same plants escape into our natural areas and become serious and basic species, we're wrecking the food web in the natural areas as well. There are three kinds of plants. There's plants that contribute food to the food web, continue to contribute energy to the food web. There are plants that do not contribute energy to the food web. And there are plants that actually take energy away from the food web, detractors. Uh, contributors are something like that. Oh, a picture of is they're the very best contributors. They're contributing more energy to food webs than any other type of plant. Uh, our friend the ginkgo, it's a non-contributor. Uh, it's, it's not detracting, it's just sitting there. It's kind of like a, a statue. It's pretty, but it's not supporting any caterpillars that are contributing food to the food web. Then we have actively uh, detracting plants, things like calorie ban, any calorie pair, any of our, our serious invasive species. Are detractors because not only are they not making food that supports the food web, they're moving into our natural areas and removing the plants that do support food webs. And that's what the typical calorie pair invasion looks like. I know you've seen it, it's impossible to go anywhere without seeing them in the spring. So, all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're going to restore food webs, if we're going to restore our local ecosystems, we have to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work, but we do choose the right plants, starting with, with uh, my house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is where uh, my wife Cindy and I moved in the year 2000. It was a uh, house, no, it was a farm that got broken up into 10 acre lots. And we got one of those, those lots. It had been mowed for hay before we moved in. It's a very old farm, it's been farmed for 300 years. So just about all the plants were gone. So our job, our goal was to restore this, this local ecosystem. And of course, you're not going to do that without bringing the catacombs back. So I'm going to give you some examples of how we actually did that. This is a Canadian outlet. I've never even seen a Canadian outlet. And people say, well, why did you choose a Canadian outlet? The truth is, I was looking through Dave Wagner's Catacombs of Eastern North America, and I said, that's a pretty one. Let's get that one. <laughs> I think it's pretty. That's what the adult looks like. It looks just like a leaf. Can we get Canadian owls on our property? Well, they're host plant specialists on meadow root. We didn't have any meadow. Well, what happens if I plant meadow root? Will they come back? There's no meadow root anywhere around this site. I'm sure it was there hundreds of years ago, but long gone. So I did get some meadow root seeds from some parties, and I planted them, and they grew very nicely. But it was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owls would be able to find my plant meadow root. So I didn't even go out and check it for a couple months after I planted it. But then one day I was walking by for another reason. I looked over. It's covered with Canadian owls. They found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. So now we have a good population of meadow root and Canadian owls. So we've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a, it's a specialist on this plant, by the Zaristos ditch days. We didn't have any ditch daisy, but I did know where some was. A power line cut 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home, they grew very nicely. I'd wait a year for the golden red stowaway to find my, my bodies, but it did, and now we've got a good population of both of those. Now we've added four species. I wanted the Hackberry Emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that should be at our house. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry. So I planted Hackberry. I had to wait four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they finally did. I looked at one of the branches on one of my hackberries last June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. 
So now we've added six pieces, and that's how the that's how the restoration went. I did not play goldenrod; came in on its own, along with it came many things that that uh, require goldenrod. The beautiful round rooted mallet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparing anopus, the goldenrod ball moth. Now this is one that hasn't come: the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't found my golden rod, but it hasn't, that's what the caterpillars look like. But this is still part of the fun. It's anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. <laughs> Every year I go out and I check my golden rod looking for these caterpillars. One of these years I'm gonna find it, and that'll be a great one. I play a Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I know some people don't like Virginia creeper, I just don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. You can climb our trees without curling them, without pulling them down. It's a good ground cover. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. They're very high in fat, that's what the birds need. It's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. Its flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. You don't even know it's blooming until you see this cloud of native bees around. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If the plants are not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plan it because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal plants. Things like the Pandora sphinx and this beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hot sphinx, the adder sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent at our house. It's an elm specialist. Well, I wanted it just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta like that. Well, of course, it was on American elm. We don't have any American elm. We lost it to Dutch elm disease decades ago. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. Every year they make a lot of seed. Actually, today they're probably dropping those seeds. So I got some. The year we moved in, planted them, they grew very nicely. Those trees are now 80 feet tall. And they did bring in the double two prominent, another big success, American elm. I wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, believe it or not, it's a specialist on evening primrose. We didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted it in the theater. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed with the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. So those are just examples of the plant lineages we put on our, our property. Uh, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such an important place. That's the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. It's Martha Stewart land. It's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant a note because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy it when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't. <laughs> but if you can enjoy what your oak is delivering, what is contributing to your local food web, to your local ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that the confidence was I planted most of my oaks as acorns. Acorns. What do you call this? Say it again. Okie dokie, here it is. Acorns. Which means they were free. This was free too. Or I planted this two foot bare root whips, look very much like that, which means they cost a dollar fifty each. And immediately they started to rebuild. The local food web by attracting moths that created the caterpillars that transferred the energy to everything else. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the Suzuki's uh, chromolactus, red wash caterpillar, yellow vested moth, the orange tufted onida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak monkey, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red hump oak worm, the orange hump oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. The hesitant dynamo, the lesser of dynamo, the greater of dynamo, the street dynamo, the afflicted dynamo, the crown view of the the orange pad smoky wing, the white flash header of amber, the oblique header of amber, the red line panopole, the lavender, and literally hundreds more species of moss have come to the oaks at my house. This is an exclusive clap for oaks because they are the very best. And those moths come right away. That's a pin that just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So you don't have to wait decades or centuries for your oak to start to pass on its energy. It does it right away. This is what our house looks like today from the same position I took that original picture. Um, got a little lawn there. We're very traditional. But I put a lot of plants back. Not all the plants. I don't know what was there originally, but we keep adding plants. 
And through the years, we've learned how important caterpillars were to local ecosystem functions. So about five years ago, I, I said, I'm going to try to count all the moths that are making a living in my house. Take a picture of them. Um, it's a big job. I was scared to do it. But, and I'm still at it. But I am up to 1,140 species so far that are making a living in our house because we put the plants back. Restoration. Remember, we got up to six. Now we're up to 1,140. And we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the landmass, we're supporting 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of them are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? So this is another depressing headline that we hear about all, all the time. World wildlife funds since we've lost two thirds of, of Earth's wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, not in our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. Imagine what would happen if everybody put the plants back. We could turn headlines like this around. We really can. Please don't give up. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres, and a lot of people don't have that much land. Will it work on smaller properties in, in suburban neighborhoods? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Kirksworth's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Sydney and I have. And they're in the middle of suburbia. Everybody's got the big lawns around them. When they moved into their property, it was it was loaded with bush honeysuckle, armor honeysuckle. From, from Asia and other invasive species. So they got rid of that. Then they planted 75 species of native plants, put in a water feature, and then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. They are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only counted eight warbler species at, at our house. So that's a very good, excuse me, very good number on only 0.6 acres. It does work on smaller properties. Okay, we're in urban yards. Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago. She's right next to O'Hare Airport. She has one tenth of an acre, three times less land or smaller lot size than the average lot size in, in North America. And she's not connected to any natural area. So she's a tiny little island in the middle of Chicago. She's a pretty island, but she did the same thing. She took out her, her non native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature. Then she sat back and started to count the birds using her yard, and she's up to 124 species that have used her yard, including the woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen the woodcock, you really go to Pam's house in Chicago. So, all right, there's four things we need to, to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way, and we do want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink those big lawns. As of 2005, we had 40 million acres of lawn in this country, which is an area the size of New England, dedicated to an ecological dead state. Uh, why do we do this? It's a status thing. It's, you know, it's left over from the, the aristocracy in, in Europe, the class system, only the rich could have lawns. So of course, we all want big lawns. Uh, of course, we also need to display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? We could still have lawns, but what if we had half the area in lawn? What if we took areas like this and turned it into this? This is a picture from Dan Gettin. Uh, he, he lives in Missouri. I've never met him. He sent me this picture. He said, look, I have a big lawn and I'm converting it. Those are all, that's a native planting. It's only the second year of the planting. Well, if we did that, that would give us 20 million acres towards our restoration. And if we did it at home, we could create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyon Lands, Baffer Deer, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, plus Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And of all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park being the biggest national park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? We put some part of nature where we live. We get the opportunity to develop a relationship with that part of nature. Get to know, get to love Mother Nature at our own time, our own pace. All we have to do is go outside. Or, or even less, all we have to do is look out the window. 
We can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people were there with you last, last year. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the pipe. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. alone. And I think that's absolutely necessary to developing that personal relationship with Mother Nature, not mediated by somebody else. I think it's especially important for our kids. Our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder or even rich and blue. So we're trying. We get, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher, they drive for an hour to a natural area, they walk around for a while, and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and the teacher telling them not to touch them. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it alone. No parental supervision. Let them become friends on their own terms. They will come home again. You know, when we hover over the kids, for whatever reason, we're sending the message that whatever they're doing is really, really dangerous. And that is not the message we want to send about Mother Nature. Our kids are the future stewards of Mother Nature, of planet Earth. If they don't know that, if they don't know how to steward, if they don't love stewarding, they're going to be lousy stewards. And none of that will be true if they don't become friends with, with Mother Nature. We don't need any more lousy stewards. So. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in a very modest patch of nature in, in Hawaii. It's a piece of lawn with a hedge, but there are no lizards there. And when she found that out, she sent me this picture to describe how you, how you uh, hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on a lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of a lizard, hopefully before the lizard dies. You become friends with the lizard. You fall in love with that part of Mother Nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress the rest of her life catching lizards. I don't think. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a lizard hanging from her nose. <laughs> She sent me this picture not too long ago. But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of that experience. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Sprinsky's nature play at home. Dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it. Go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org and register your property on the map where you are uh, and the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. If you're cutting your area long in half, put that in there. If you're planting some native trees, put that in there. If you've got a little wood lot in your property, put that in there. Anything that you're stewarding properly, add that to, to uh, the website. And then your little piece of your county is going to light up. You get to see everybody else who's doing this in your town. The object is to get the message that we all, everybody, not just the choir, that everybody is responsible for taking care of Mother Earth, Mother Earth, Mother Nature. We want that message to go viral. And we're trying to use this as a social media uh, mechanism. The whole US is going to light up as people start doing this getting on the map. And that should stimulate other people to do it just because it's fun to get on the map. We hope anyway. We've got about 15,000 people that have signed up so far. So we're on our way. I will be happy when we have 150 million people because then we're making real progress. Uh, okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that was once long? I'm going to argue that some of those have to be what I'm calling keystone species. What's a keystone? That's the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives us food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up that house. They're essential. They're the support. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. 
You're not through building your house when you got your, your keystone plants in there, but they're an essential part. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than non natives. On average, they certainly are, but there are a lot of natives that don't contribute all that much. So the question really is do we want to favor the plants that do contribute all that much, the top contributors to both uh, pollinators and caterpillars, or not? What is the best contributor? Well, I already mentioned it. it's one of the oaks. Uh, in the mid Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to this. And if you want to know what the best plants, the most, the most productive plants are in your county, go to Native Plant Finder, the National Wildlife Federation website. Put in your zip code and the rank list of both the woody plant genera and the herbaceous plant genera that are supporting the most caterpillars will pop up. But in that herbaceous plant genera, the one on the right there, things like goldenrods, asters, uh, perennial sunflowers, not only are they the best caterpillar makers, they're also the best supporting specialist bees. When you're planting a pollinator garden, you want to plant for the specialists, the ones that can only use particular plants, because the generalists can use those plants as well. If you plan just for generalists, you've lost all your specialists. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security plant, which is not, that's not the goal. There's a lot of research coming out these days, particularly from Europe, that is, is showing quite conclusively that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines around the world. That's a list of all the ways that lights kill her. It's particularly those nocturnal laws that are making all those chemicals. But to me, this is good news. It's good news because we have got to stop insect decline. We've already lost more than half of the insects on the planet. They're the things that run the planet, that run the world. We can't afford to lose anymore. If we can turn that around by simply flipping a switch, we're getting up easy. There's a lot of switches we have to flip, but we can do it. But I know what you're going to say. Oh, I can't turn the light out over my garage or over my barn or over my front porch because of bad man. All right. Put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does. And the first thing you'll notice is the bad man doesn't come right <laughs> And if you don't want to do that, take the, the white bulb out of your security bulb and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. If we switch out our white light lights for yellow lights, or yellow lights for white lights, uh, overnight we would save millions of insects and millions of dollars too if we use LEDs because they're a lot more energy efficient. So we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to turn out our lights, then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. Booming business around the country. <clears throat> Uh, Mosquito Joe is single-handedly undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 20 years. But he says it's okay, because this is a natural problem. And he's right, it's pyrethroids. It's the same compound found in uh, chrysanthemums. It's industrial strength pyrethroids, much stronger. But, you know, the argument that it's a natural product doesn't hold much water. Cyanide is a natural product, too. But that doesn't mean you should be spraying it. Um, he also says it only kills mosquitoes, and I wish he was right really do, but in fact, it kills all the insects that it comes in contact with. I don't know if you remember headlines from not this fall, but the previous fall, big monarch kills during migration, they flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. How do you think you can kill a mosquito without killing other, other insects? But the interesting thing is, it doesn't control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Very, very hard. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50 percent of the mosquitoes. So he's not even close to actually controlling the mosquito population, which is why he has to keep coming back and you have to keep paying. If you really want to control mosquitoes, get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, and let it ferment for a couple of days in the sun. You're building up populations of diatoms and algae. That's what mosquito larvae eat. That becomes an irresistible brew to local female mosquitoes who want to lay their eggs. They're going to oviposit in your bucket. Let those eggs hatch. It takes just a few days. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mos mosquito dunks. You put one of those mosquito dunks in your bucket. That's Bacillus thuringiensis. 
It's a, a formulation that only kills aquatic pivoter. And the only aquatic pivoter in your bucket is the skew art. It's extremely targeted. If a dragonfly gets in there, not going to hurt it at all. If your dog drinks it or a bird drinks it, not going to hurt it at all. Somebody asked me the other day, what about my child? Not going to hurt it at all. <laughs> you might put a coarse screen over your bucket so a uh, chipmunk doesn't jump in and, and drown. Uh, but you know, mosquito ducks, it costs $9. It's a very cheap and targeted way to control mosquitoes. And if everybody did it, we'd have a lot fewer mosquitoes without killing everything else. Fourth thing you need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete the development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is just an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete the development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from a branch, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. But that's unusual. Most species, 94% of them, finish growing as caterpillars and they drop from the tree and they wiggle the leaf to ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact our soils so that they're rock hard and the caterpillars can't get underground. So the way we landscape in so many places becomes an ecological trap. The caterpillars come in, or the, the moths come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, drop down, and die. And I am convinced this is another major cause of insect declines wherever we landscape like this, which is everywhere. And of course, the cement landscape is not going to do it either. Uh, this is what uh, most people do. You've got a tree in your yard and surrounded by, by grass. And this summer, we're going to start to actually measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they do better in a situation like this. You have a layered landscape. You've got a tree that may be a dog with, and maybe a and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillars drop down. It's a soft landing. They can easily get underground because the ground is not, not compacted. Nobody's going to mow them. Nobody's going to step on them. Plenty of leaf litter under there. They can spend a cocoon. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you, you shrink the lawn. You put beds around your, all of your trees, and all of a sudden you have a lot less lawn. The bigger, the better. Those are all safe sites. This is where you can use your, your native ground covers. So things like wild ginger, uh, mayapple, foam flower, ferns, all great. Safe sites. There's a dozens of ground covers. That Virginia creeper we talked about, all of them will make great safe sites. Well, we're not going to talk about that. OK. Um, another grad student, Desiree Narango. She's a former grad student. Did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. She has one simple question, and the results suggest there's actually room for compromise. Uh, in the plants that we choose, and that's that's good news. Do you want to know how well chicken populations do in suburban landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by introduced plants? Uh, well, the first thing she found is that uh, when they're dominated by introduced plants, those landscapes produce seventy-five percent fewer cattle. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by seventy-five percent. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. There's a nest box up in everybody's yard. The chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here, we're not even gonna try. Now, if they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. If you put all that together in a population growth model, which you probably can't see, this is what you get. You do it as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, from none to 100%. The dotted line in the middle there is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die. Chickadees don't live that long. And if you breed at that level, that is a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, what's happening on this end of the graph, you have a growing population, but if you make fewer babies than adults die, what's below the dotted line here, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. So right here, roughly speaking, is where those lines overlap or intersect. That's the area of compromise. You can have up to 30 percent of your your landscape non-native plants. They can't be invasive because those guys are 
are tumors, they just keep growing. Uh, but things like the ginkgo, things like your persidia or your boxwood, those things are not invasive, they're not moving. You can have 30%, up to 30% without destroying the local food plant. As long as your landscape is dominated by those powerful native plants. Remember Dan, Dan Yetman's landscape here? That's a ginkgo. What's a ginkgo doing in his native planting? His wife asked her, what do you think of She likes ginkgo, so Dan's a nice guy and he did. Is it destroying the landscape? No. Remember, it's just a statue, it's just sitting there. Is it contributing? No, but it's not dominating either. So it's still a very productive landscape. It's not the presence of non-native plants that are, that are destroying local food webs. It's the absence of the natives that support those food webs. So you increase the natives supporting those food webs and we can tolerate some more. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lino Shaughnessy design, uh, gave it to me last year. It's taken by a drone 400 feet up. It's a big garden, and every plant in that garden is a native plant. And you don't get more formal than that. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're not native plants. <laughs> Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, put little pets around. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbor it's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's pretty when it's in bloom, it's servicing a number of species of bees. It's not very big, it could be bigger, but if everybody did it, it would help a lot. And don't forget why we need pollinators. The media has misled you. You see, you need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's about a 12 of our crops. And people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so why do we need pollinators? Forget the crop market. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants, including our crops. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, including our crops. Uh, and that would not be good. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this design? It's a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger. Imagine the amount of life support there versus the amount of life support on the grass and it's, it seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can. And more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost-sharing program. It encourages homeowners to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's very popular. It's called the Lawn and Light Game Program. There's an island off of, of Florida where they're encouraging homeowners to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. They're paying them to allow them to do that. That's the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you, if you lose your property. Everybody would want an endangered species instead of killing them all on their property. Put a bounty on, on invasive plants, like St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, North Carolina, South Carolina has banned cattle repair altogether. If you take out a cattle repair, you get a free tree replacement. It changes the culture. People will get it that we should not be planting these plants. Uh, water utilities are giving people $100 coupons to plant uh, you know, native plants that are, are adapted to low water situations rather than thirsty non-natives. And of course, the big lawn replacement programs in California, that's going up now, you get $3 per square foot, or $3 rebate for every square foot of lawn that you take out and replace with a program zero. And if you want to know more about those programs, <laughs> memorize that. <laughs> okay, I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation, and this is an important one. We start to think about nature as if it's optional. We like it, we like to visit it, we like to read about it, watch it on television, uh, but it's not essential, which means when push comes to shove and resources are in short supply, which is always, nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall sized poster there, uh, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so that future generations can enjoy it. That's the message I get. It's the message I get directly from Teddy Roosevelt. We're going to create the national park system because these are beautiful places and we want future generations to be able to enjoy them. Well, I get it that nature is enormously entertaining, but it's a lot more than that. We need nature so that we have future generations. 
It's not just about entertainment. We've also assumed that humans in nature cannot coexist. And we talked about that, but if we restrict conservation just to areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail because there's not enough of those areas anymore. David Quammen has a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That's a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystem. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I don't like that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, including our agriculture. So we've got to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back. Not just to make biological corridors so that plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats. But to replace, to restore viable habitats where we destroy them, where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we shop, all of those places. This is the visualization of homegrown national park. When we do this, it will be the first time in modern history that we actually are coexisting with nature. Our third misstep was to leave our stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't think it was an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, because every single person on the planet absolutely requires healthy functioning ecosystems. So why wouldn't they have the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Pressworth, the chair of the elder once said, the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of uh, indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you are taught them. We are very good at teaching our kids and our peers that we have rights. We are terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that they have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live, and if you do, it empowers you. Right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth's problems are huge, getting worse every day. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can remove the invasive plants they already have on their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can turn out the lights, one person can fire the speed of Joe, one person can use keystone plants, one person can totally revitalize the ecosystem right where they live and contribute to their greater local ecosystem rather than continue to degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You will get depressed. Just worry about a piece of the earth that you can manage, that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land, uh, a land conservancy, a park, or a preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like that. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate, and then ultimately our own fate. And I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. I do want to take some questions from the audience for Doug. Uh, before I do so, I want to have a couple special thank yous. Uh, one to the board of the Community Life Collaborative, the staff of the Community Life Collaborative, you can stand up and uh, people give a thank you to them. A few months back, so thank you, Mary. And thank you, Anne, for the beautiful, lovely centerpieces. And Sue for putting together all the pieces in these weeks. So, uh, with that, Doug? Yep. Okay, any questions? <coughs> yes. We have a very large credit uh, card, particularly in our backyard. Um, last year, I climbed up the ladder in a very conservative way to cut down. Category. I was worried that the 
know when it's going to work out and you have to leave by the first, or they're going to take over the city and kill us. Okay, you, there's what, what time of year was that? Middle summer. So it's probably fall weather. Yeah. Um, it's a native insect, just like the tent caterpillar, uh, and they were called an eruptive species. So they, they have spikes and, and troughs. Some years there's a lot of them, other years there's very few. And when there's a lot of them, there's this big tents up there. You know, if they didn't make a tent, you wouldn't even know you were there. But the tent says, uh oh, we're here. Uh, so it makes you do crazy things on the ladder. Uh, <laughs> ignoring. Uh, they are eating some leaves. You know what? They, that tent surrounds the leaves they have eaten. So you can look at the tent and say, hey, they didn't, they didn't eat that many leaves. You want to know how many leaves a spice brush it takes to make a spice brush swallowtail? Three. Can you spice brush spare three leaves? Yes, you can. It'll be fine. So sometimes, like tent caterpillar, they will defoliate a small cherry tree. And we get all upset. I had a cherry tree when I defoliated 10 years in a row. I finally had to cut it down because it got too big. It was right next to the house. I didn't even plan. Didn't even slow it down a bit. These are these are natural interactions, and I know those those are species that bother us. But if they kill the tree, the tree was highly stressed for some other reason. Trees are much better at handling the rivery like that than we think. Last summer, I had 100 tent caterpillar nests on my property. Walk around and count each one. And after about, about two weeks, they didn't get any bigger. So I went around, looked, every single one was sliced open, and none of the caterpillars were there. We also had a yellow bell cuckoo that happens to eat 10 caterpillars and fall weapons. They specialize on hairy caterpillars. Other birds don't like hairy caterpillars because the hairs get stuck in their esophagus and their stomach. But cuckoos can throw them up and put a new esophagus and new lining in there. So they, they, they follow gypsy moth populations around. By the way, the gypsy moth is not a spongy moth. It really is. Um, the problem is we never have enough yellow bill and black bill cuckoos. So people get upset. But it is just, it's best just to think, ignore it. Your tree will be fine, I guarantee. Yes. Okay, what happens when you have a bee nest in your house? Is that what you're saying? Like, yes. They're going to spray you now. But what are they spraying? There's nothing there now. That was last year. And it probably was yellow jackets. So if you actually have somebody who's allergic, you have a yellow jacket in your foundation or something, you do want to get rid of it. They will stick it. They're very aggressive. They're not bees. Uh, now, it is possible that a honeybee uh, Well, it could be bumblebees. They're you know, they're very non-aggressive, uh, very gentle. Almost certainly would be stuck. But if you don't want to tolerate them close by, okay. But you know, the all the the colony dies in the fall. It's only one queen that are winter. She will not nest in the same place. Almost certainly. If you hire somebody to come spray, he's going to spray an empty hole, and you paid a lot of money for nothing. So, yeah, he's taking advantage of your fear. We'll wait until you see them again. Yes. Do we have any indigenous groups involved with the Homegrown National Park? I don't know. Uh, you know, there are 15,000 people that have signed up. I don't follow that. I'm not running this website. So. Yeah, it would be Michelle up and Barry. You could look up on the list. But do they identify themselves as an indigenous group? I haven't known. I really don't. It might be good to know that, but I don't know. Anything else? Yes. Dr. Doug, uh, have you been able to uh, convert any of your neighbors to also be part of the national park that you have created? Or are you just a crazy bug man down the street? I'm anonymous. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, people have always asked me that. So I had a neighbor 
10 acres right next to me, 100% of the plants on his property were non-native, including 32 calorie pears. Um, and so people said, have you converted him yet? Well, you know, what if your neighbor walks over to you and say, you're not living right. You have to live like I'm going to live because you're wrong and I'm right. That doesn't usually work very well. Uh, I think the best you could do is, is present an example and see, see what happens. Well, what's happened is that neighbor has moved. We have new neighbors that came in. I didn't say a word, but all of a sudden I found that they hired Larry Weiner. If you don't know, he's a, he's a big time meadow maker in the, in the East. Not cheap, but they hired him to do their entire 10 acres. They cut down all 32 bread repairs, gave me the wood. <laughs> I burned all winter long on those gallery pairs. Uh, so they're, they're going completely native all on their own. I didn't say a word. That's great. Yes. I was going to offer, I certified my backyard as a national wildlife to the National Wildlife Federation. And two more of our neighbors have been successful. Yeah, putting a sign up uh, is uh, a way of explaining what you're doing. It shows that it's, it's purposeful, you, know, you haven't moved out, it's not just a bunch of groups. There's a, there's a function to it. And that, that is enough to push some people over the cultural edge. They don't want to, they don't want to push the envelope. But people are getting it. You know, when the, when the uh, headline, we've got global insect decline came out, I didn't think anybody would care about that. But I got emails right away saying, this is terrible, what can we do? So people do care. They really care about the 3 billion birds being, being lost and that the millions, the UN says we're going to lose a million species. People are upset about that. So we say, there is something you can do to do it. I, I'm not hearing a lot of pushback on this. I'm really not. Yes. I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, we had some like patriots who died last year, and in my thought process, never went to my wife's forest, native insects in, in my yard. Of course, now that we forward, I'll be more educated about that. But the other piece of that is how do we get landscapers to care? Okay, how do we get landscapers to care? Why did you automatically think you had to support insects? Because you were raised in a culture that says nature someplace else. You don't have to worry about it. Your yard's just about being pretty. There is no someplace else now. And we're getting that, but most people haven't heard of it. And it's not your fault. You were not taught that in school. You don't, you can't turn on the television and see that. So why would you do that? You know, typically, in my typical audience, there are landscapers. I, I talked to the ASLA, the you know, landscape architect, national meetings, I don't know, three times so far. So I am getting invited by landscape landscapers and landscape architects all the time. It's, it's not, it is easier to convert a landscape architect because they're in the hard state, not in the plants. They don't really care about plants. They just want to make steps. Um, landscape designers have been doing it for a long time have their favorite plants and there, there are other stuff. Um, because they still think plants are just decorations. But a lot of them are coming so it is happening. Yes. I graduated 15 years ago from Waterfall. And we weren't taught much more. I'm hoping it's much more now. It's a very small fish class. Yeah, the. the we have a huge empty niche in, in this area, and that is ecological landscapers or ecological gardeners. Most people don't garden at all. They don't have the time to. It's something they don't, they don't want to. They'd love to do the right thing, but they're not going to do it. They want to hire somebody. And right now, the only people they can hire are the mobile and go guys that are going to cut their lawn and, and build volcano mulches. So we've got to get people out there who can hang out their shingles and say, I know what to do. I will pick the right plants, I will take care of them. You still don't have to do anything, you just have to hire me instead. I will mow your yard, but there's going to be less of it. And by the way, the grass you keep should be manicured. It's a cue for care. It shows you, you, you do know what the culture is, and you're going to fit in. You're just going to have less lawn. And when you know, so if you know anybody's looking for a career, that's a good one, and there's a need for it. Yes. You're looking for a career? I have had it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually, so I'm a 
Lambs Creek Park uh, in Winter City, Akron. And um, I, uh, I, I still have a question for you, but um, so yeah, I get a phone call from my brother and he told me that I'm on the Lambs Creek Park. But my, my question is actually about um, so. You know, I work in the inner city, I work in a huge part of my area. Um, so I do a lot of food forage and work. And I incorporate a lot of ages in the operation, obviously, but um, you know, I also have to incorporate apples and pears and things that are native that I don't recognize as food and things that you can never get. Um, does that third percentage that's not native apply? Uh, the whole thing is very flexible. When I'm talking about landscaping, I'm not talking about giving up farming or agriculture or producing food. We're not going to do that. Uh, so of course we have to we have to continue to grow. And any local growing of, of food is very valuable. You're cutting down um, transportation energy. You know what what you put on it. We didn't put on it, so we can control its quality. So those are apples and oranges. You know, the plants that you're not eating in your yard, uh, let's make them mostly native. But we're not native either to North America, and most of it we, we you know we evolved with someplace else, and we bring those over with us. That includes apples. We know what native food corn is native. I mean, we're not talking about that. We created it. Came from Mexico. Uh, Pause and squashes and hickories and walnuts and things, but, but you know, um, two different things. We want to we, we want to grow as much food locally as we can. Uh, but what are you going to do with the rest of your land? Most people talk about their garden, and they're either talking about their vegetable garden or their flower garden. They're not thinking about the entire landscape. I try not to use the word garden because it's your entire landscape that you need to think about. If you have a five by ten foot garden next to your front steps and a two acre lawn, we want to talk about the lawn, not the garden. So, yes. Mulch. Yeah. What do I think about mulch? Um, what do I think about bare ground? Bare ground is terrible because what you want to do is maintain the soil humidity, and that requires high humidity. You want to return the nutrients that your plants use that year in the form of leaves. That nutrients in the leaves will fall down to the very best mulch that's leaf, and that will return the nutrients in a natural way. What we typically do now is break away all of our leaves. We break away 70 species of litter moths that eat those things. We break away the litter moth cocoon and all the other things that are in those things. Uh, and then we buy wood chips, which is better than nothing. It's some kind of protection for the ground, but uh, it actually absorbs nitrogen from the ground in order to break down these wood chips. So it's not returning nutrients to the soil. Uh, so it's not nearly as good as the leaves that fall from your trees that nobody wants. So that, there, that's the problem. Uh, I don't know, you saw those pictures I showed you of the soft landings. There were leaves under all of those, but there's three faults on top of it. Plant your plants right through the leaves, don't break them away, and then you have a closed nutrient cycle. So the, the nutrients your tree used the year before will be returned to the soil. There are more species that live in the ground than above the ground, and they're all breaking down those leaves, making it work. That's where all your microbes and fungi are, but they need high humidity. And if you don't have that, it all, it all dies. So, leaf litter is the best if you can keep it around in some form. That's the way to go. Yes. While we're on that subject, several of us have gotten some training and planting trees. And of course, we know not to walk in the mulch and that sort of thing. And they usually tell us, don't plant anything under the trees. And we're saying, yes, plant under the trees. Well, how can I go back and say that battalion Well, um, so you're taught not to plant anything under the trees, and I'm saying plant things under the trees. It depends on where you're planting them. A, a, a tree canopy can be quite broad, 
I agree, don't plant something right next to the trunk. It's too shaded and it's too dry and there's too much competition. Uh, but that's where good, that's where leaf litter can go. The farther out you go, the more plantable it becomes. And it becomes a layered landscape the way you would find in a healthy forest. And a healthy forest is not one with 140 deer per square mile, which is 14 times over the carrying capacity. And that's why we see nothing in the forest and we say, oh, that's natural. That's not. There should be understory there. Um, so you do want to get it away from the trunk a little bit, and it depends on what species of tree it is. Some of them throw a whole bunch of shade. It's really hard to do that. And maybe you could just be happy with your leaf litter. That's a soft landing too. It's not being mowed. It's not being, being compacted. Um, so it takes a, a little bit of judgment there. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So how old were you when you read Smile? How old was I when I read well, let's. I was in graduate school. Um, was it in Aha? I, I guess so. I mean, uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey and we used to go down to the shore uh, and you drive down Long Beach Island and on every telephone pole there was an osprey nest. And I remember the summer I drove down there and all the osprey nests were up there and there wasn't a single osprey. That was an Aha moment. Then Rachel Carson said, This is what I said. Oh, of course. But you know, shortly after that, they actually banned EBT, and I, I saw it was a good thing. Okay, we've got a handle on this here. The, the actual story is that, that most of the insect pests that DDT was developed for had already become resistant to it. So the chemical companies stopped fighting it, and that's why the bans were here. And then they came up with new, better uh, organophosphates and other types of, of pesticides. So we're not done with the pesticides. We're big into neonicotinoids now, which are 7,000 times more toxic than DDT was to insects and birds. And we use it for no reason. We put them as seed coatings on our corn, our soybean, and everything we buy, those purple and you know, pink seeds. 5% is taken up by the plant, 95% of the material washes off the seed, gets into the water table, or blows away in the dust. Uh, and then we wonder why we have insect So we're still doing it, it's just not DDT. Yes. You mentioned the program in Minnesota to incentivize the planting of prairie plants. Are there programs like that in other parts of the country? And can you give us advice on how we might approach our local officials to get programs like that started? Um, did you memorize all those? <laughs> Look, look it up and it will tell you about this program. So you can see here's an example. Here's a state that's, that's doing this uh, and, and it's working and people really like it. Remember, our elected officials are elected by us. If we let them know what we want, they'll do it. They'll do anything to get elected. They just have to think that most people want this. So you have to be more vocal about what we, what we want. Uh, there was a lawn conversion program in Pennsylvania. That you got five thousand dollars per square foot. No, five thousand dollars per acre. Is that right? Five thousand per acre. Yeah, no, five thousand. Maybe maybe you're up to five thousand dollars to get your 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 lawn. Uh, and it went fine for two years. And I've been talking about it. And somebody looked up on the website the other day. It's gone. And I, I think it was a little too successful, a little too generous. Um, or, or they have so many people sign up they can't meet the needs and they're not advertising anymore. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not going to say no to the state. I, I'm certainly in California has a lot of incentives to the state. I think Arizona has some, some too. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of convincing your representatives that this is, this is what you want to do. I think Maryland has some, some programs too. This is, this is the area of what I talk about that I actually know what it's about. Uh, I, I'm good at saying this is what everybody should do. <laughs> There's a lot of guys make, make public policy. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I recognize that in our conversation so far, uh, class and race are a huge factor in as we talked about it. Yet it's an underlying piece of all of this. Uh, 
you know, partially it's the very white space. Many of us have large long lawns, so we have houses that can afford that. Um, but I, I think a lot about urban spaces, places where there are lots of roads, lots of black tops, lots of uh, concrete, um, abandoned buildings, you know, places where other where we could do other things. Have you got any insight or suggestions or, or thoughts about how, how do we how do we get into a more urbanized environment that might actually benefit from the health uh, and well-being of, of nature space? All of them would benefit if we could get it in there. Uh, there's a lot of roadblocks there. First of all, there's this this urban legend that native plants won't grow in cities. Only Chinese plants grow in cities. <laughs> Uh, we have cement as a default landscape. Why? Because we're lazy. It lasts forever and nobody has to take care of it. Not because you need it. We know it destroys the water table. We know it increases flooding. We know it's a very unhealthy place to live. We've got a lot of statistics where you have a tree lined street, crime goes down, you take the trees away, crime goes up. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, good reasons to get trees back into cities. And people are trying to reduce the heat island. Um, but we haven't designed our cities in a way that you could do that. Go to Singapore. It's the world leader in being green, and it's a big city. They designed it that way. It can be done, but we have to think it's important that we can do it. So, and, and unfortunately, we have to undo a lot of things to do that. Look at the, look at the spaces they're, they're planning these green trees in. It's a, it's a square the size of your chair. And then they say, well, trees don't do well in urban environments. You have some soil. You have space. So, they, you know, we need to do it, but there are a lot of, a lot of uh, blocks, road blocks. Yes. Yeah, what about containers? Um, almost everybody has space for at least a container. You can put milkweeds in your container. Will monarchs come and use it? I bet they will. I don't know if anybody who studied it, but I, they're very good at finding it, even if it's five stories up. But you anything, they will. One word of warning don't plant one milkweed because one larval, one monarch caterpillar will strip it and won't have enough to complete development. You want a milkweed patch, so a couple of, uh, of rabbits in the pot. Um, I have seen Joe Pye weed. It's too bad we call our native plants weeds. Uh, the weeds are planted out of place, Joe Price had out of this. But I've seen it in big pots as well. It's a great butterfly plant. They all come, you know, it produces 36 species of, of moss. And of course, green roofs have been shown to uh, support a lot of things, particularly if you, use, if you slant it towards the native plants. The challenge with green roofs is when you're in a cold climate, the soil is only about five inches deep. So you have to have plants that can have. Roots that get frozen and make it. Not all plants do that. Uh, but yes, container gardening is, is a good option for a lot of Put an aster out there. Um, yeah, aster is really good for, for the fall migration of monarchs, so use it as they go. Our bees are really good at finding nectar plants. They can fly anywhere and find them. They would use those plants as well. So, you know, in, in Europe, there are, there are birds that only breed successfully on rooftops. Because if they're on the ground, the cats get it. So, so we can do that more than we do as well. Yes. <laughs> you have a chainsaw? <laughs> we'll get you another. So, my question is that the native plants She has 50 calorie pairs, is anybody interested in helping her chop them? <laughs> well, a tree like, you don't even have to do that. I mean, a tree that big, cut them down and then it makes The smaller ones, they do suck it up a lot. Or you can paint, paint the, the candy on the outside with, with the herbs, it's not brown, but that's designed for Something like like garlic. You know, each one of those is a is an ecological tumor. I, I got an email saying, "Well, you can't we leave just a few?" I said, "Well, how many tumors do you want leaving your body?" One. 
it's too many. I'm sorry, somebody, you know what to do? Put it in, they just say free wood. All you have to do is create some. I just wanted to respond to the reverend's uh, question. Um, Earth psychology, pre and perinatal psychology, dictum for last year was womb ecology is world ecology. And so, I keep saying we are nature. Our IMS says the ecological self is in and of nature from the very beginning of ourselves. So paying attention to supporting those mothers and the wound surround that supports them will get to the ecology. It's a long way to go, but it's really deeply that way. Uh, just a phenology card. Phenology cards. You mean measuring phenological changes to document climate change? What is phenology? Well, just in terms of slanting a sequence of plants that die and then they blossom from spring through summer to fall. So the area is like alive, attracting birds and insects throughout the whole. Okay, that is, uh, is one of the biggest challenges of having a successful pollinator landscape because you really do need blooming plants from March all the way to the end of October if you want to sustain all the species that could be in your property. There are species that come out all season long, uh, and if you have one flowering plant, it's not enough to get them through their, their life cycle. You've all heard about the no mow May. We're not going to mow in May. But in June, we're going to mow our feet and yellow again. What? That doesn't make any sense to me. The pollinators that you're helping in May need it in June, too, and July. So that there's a, there's a logical disconnect there. But choosing plants that are, that are pollinated, that are blooming in a sequence through the, the season is, is usually almost impossible with a tiny crop. If you got a bigger property, you do it, it takes some thought. But remember, the tiny property is next to another property, which is next to another property. So let's forget the property lines and think about neighborhoods. Do we have blooming plants all season one in your neighborhood? The bees will find them, even if it crosses your property line. But it's, it's not easy. It's not that terrible, but you have to know when blooms when. So, for example, goldenrod. Goldenrod is, is one of the best. Plants for not just generalists but for specialist pollinators too. And there are species of goldenrod that start blooming in mid July and bloom all the way through to the end of October. That's a real good way to cover a lot of time. And early season is easy. You've got red bud, you've got American plum, you've got a whole sequence, you've got silver bell, you've got a whole sequence of things that come out early. It's midsummer that it's a lot sparser with blooming. So that's a good time for button, button bush, uh, for, for plethora, for, um, for the Ohio Buckeyes. Uh, what's another one? Uh, the the uh, a little bit earlier would be your native hobbles. That's another one. The great pollinator plants. You don't think about that because the flowers are tiny little white things, but the native bees love them. Uh, and remember, all pollinator plants are not herbaceous. A lot of them are woody. So that's part of the problem. Yes. So we are building a house for the possible home for the workers. It's sort of like, although we don't know what that's going to be like, but I mean, so I'm not interested in like planting in the native plants, but I am interested in planting in the native plants. So I'm not going to be like, Right, the cultivar question. That's the most common question I get. When you go to a nursery, mostly what's for sale are cultivars of, of native plants. People call them native plants. Remember what a cultivar is it's a genetic variant of a straight species, whether it's native or not. And many cultivars are natural variants that were found in nature. We brought them in and we put a name on it. Like Acer Rumor October Glory, it's a really red uh, maple in the fall. 
I found out how it worked. That somebody just didn't need a bit of my money. So is that going to be as good as the others? Almost certainly, yes. When we when we make a uh, an echinacea look like a zinnia through active breeding, what's that going to do to the public? So the question, the, the answer to whether cultivars are as good as straight species is it depends on the genetic change to create the cultivar. We did a study looking at, at woody plant traits, not the flowers, but when you take a tall plant and make it short, you introduce disease resistance, you enhance fall. Uh, color if you enhance berry size, if you have red, uh, green leaves, if you become red or purple, or variegated leaves, those are the traits we looked at. And the only one that consistently reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making a red or purple. Because you loaded the leaf with anthocyanins that are feeding the germs. So all the red leaf cultivars, I can tell you right now, they're not going to support it. But, you know, that. That suggests the others could be just, just as functional. There's a caveat though, and that is that they're all propagating clonal. So you're putting zero genetic variability in the leaves. Uh, and in the long run, you know, we know that genetic variability is what's going to allow our plants to withstand climate change and anything else. That's 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 the stuff of, of adaptation. Um, so we know no genetic variability is not good. Now the, the, the research on Flowers is not as as uh, right and cheery. Any white at the University of Vermont has looked at that, and more often than not, when you change the flower trait, you're inter you're, you're messing with the specialist pollinator needs. They're adapted to the color of the, the flower, the UV color we can't even see, uh, the strength of the nectar, the, the the nutritional content of the pollen. All these things nobody looks at when they pull around. Flowers. If you buy a, a double flower, uh, you've taken all the reproductive parts and turned them into petals. It's pretty, but it's absolutely useless to pollinators. So if you buy a native plant like, like a hydrangea arborescens, good native plant, the, the, the cultivar Annabelle, it's a double flower. So you've taken away the reproductive parts. What was a great pollinator plant is now a totally useless pollinator plant because of that particular genetic change. So it depends on what the change was. Um, I would like to see our nurseries carry both straight species and the health of our so that you have the choice. Right now, if it's not there, you don't have the choice. So if you really want a choice, you can go to the nursery and say, I want this straight species, or you don't have it, I'll come back when you do. And don't buy anything else. And if that happens enough, say I'm losing business here, I'm going to start to carry that. They don't want to carry things that they don't think that people are going to buy. And for the last hundred years, the only thing the public bought were the prettiest plants. It was all about decorations. So it's still a very tough message to get to the nurseries. You're standing here and this is the end. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I ever. <laughs>